Welcome all back to the 92nd Street Y. Liz, you once said to me that in an interview that every 10 years, New York changes completely, that each decade has kind of a feeling about it. You think that's still true? You think yeah. this decade has something in particular that's different from previous decades? Even worse <laughs> than previous decades. Worse? I, uh, I am uh, against the internet age with all of its technicalities. I think it's, but I suppose when they invented the combustion engine that people were against giving up their horses. So I'm sure I'm wrong. But for me, it's just a loss. Like uh, the New York Times uh, today is all about techno books. So I couldn't read it. What do you think has been lost? Well, it, I don't think it's good when everybody's opinion is the same. I mean, and everybody has an opinion, and you try to, you, you don't read, you look frantically, I do, for bylines, mm -hmm. because I don't care what millions of people think, or Twitter. I, I'm just too old fashioned for mm. this. Pete, you wrote in one of your books that when you were growing up, New York was a great big optimistic town. That was one of the quotes. Do you think it still is? Um, parts of it. <laughs> uh, obviously, I think for the new generation of immigrants, Chinese, Mexican, Ecuadorian, whoever, uh, particularly today's paper had a very interesting takeout on Queens as the new borough, since nobody <laughs> can afford Brooklyn anymore. <laughs> uh, so, and Queens has the greatest ethnic mixture of any of the boroughs. Um, so I think for them, if you look at the front of the paper, you're reading about countries whose major export could be people eventually. Yeah. And they're not gonna go to Libya. Right. Um, so I think, you know, long run, if we can hold things together in the country, uh, that you're gonna have a bigger and better place with a, without a sense of American exceptionalism, whatever the hell that means. Um, and without spying on everybody uh, within sight or out of sight, uh, we, we, we seem somehow to be able to bug the heads of state all over, the, all over Europe and can't get a computer system to work for healthcare. <laughs> What the hell is that all about? Let, let alone to know when the A-train's gonna be showing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's putting technology to use. You all came here from other places, and you came here to write, you came here to report. So, Gay, when you th think about young writers who are here now, do you think the landscape has changed so totally, or do you think there are common threads between when you came here from New Jersey and then University of Alabama, and you started working at the Times, uh, to common thread to those years, mid 50s, to what's going on right now? Or is it just so different well, that it's all, all, all changed? I think that the changes that I've noted in the more than 50 years of residing here have been changes for the better. I think that the opportunities that I had or thought I had <clears throat> when I was in my early 20s, are still here for young, aspiring writers or journalists. I think the city that I remember, and the place in which I live today, I've lived in the same place for more than 50 years. I have a, from the vantage point of, a, of an occupant of a single block on the east 60s of New York, I have not seen, when I moved in in 1958, and still there in 2013, there has not been any change for the worse. The buildings are the same. <clears throat> the, um, the people that either 
work in the area or live in the area are pretty much the same. I think that where there have been great changes from the 50s, when I was young to now, are changes that are positive. For example, when I first came to New York, before I moved in the 60s, I lived for two years in Mulberry Street. I was a copy boy for the New York Times at first, and then later on I was a, a night rewrite man. And what I remember about <coughs> Mulberry Street, or remember about the lower part of Manhattan, what was so unusual then, for example, were black and white people dating. That was so unusual. I remember there's a bar called Louis Bar, and I think it was in Sheridan Square. And there was one place that had, had blacks and whites dating together. Oh, it was Today, you know, we may have an interracial couple in, in Gracie Mansion. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we have that situation with our president, and it's so common. I think that the city is cleaner. We used to be dogs would poop all over the sidewalk, you'd step in it before the pooper scoopers that were, I think, introduced by Mayor Koch, if I'm not, maybe I'm wrong. But today it's a much cleaner, safer city. Granted, we have debate on frisk on the, on the, on the issues of, of the police department. But it's a safer city. Central Park is a safer place. People can sit in Times Square. I used to work out the late, I used to leave the New York Times building as, an, as a rewrite man at 11 or 12 or 1 o'clock. And you always would get, if you weren't approached and frisked by, by some guy that wanted your wallet, you always had problems there. Mm -hmm. There aren't the problems there now. So this is, I'm not saying any mayor is to be credited, with, but I think it's a better city now than I ever remember. And, and it's so crowded with people from all over the world testifying the fact people like to come here, like to visit here as tourists, like to stay here as people. And finally, I do think that poorer people, people that are not on, uh, you know, that aren't up here on stage, are still finding a place to live, including in Manhattan. I know, I know a lot of poor people in this town that do live much better than they would and more happy about being part of Manhattan or, or New York than was the case when I was 50 years ago when I was young. Now getting back to the, the dogs no longer pooping on the sidewalk or in the street, that was because of a phone call, Calvin, that you made, right? You kind of took care of that whole thing. Is that correct? <laughs> or I'm, am, I, am I misquoting you on No, on I was anti-poop. There's no doubt yeah. about that. <laughs> um, well, I think we have our headline for the well, night. <laughs> Trillin reveals himself to That's be right. anti-poop. Under, uh, under, gru under uh, grueling, grueling questioning. Yes, grueling, of right. Um, I've, I haven't, uh, I've lived also in the same place, not as long as gay, but I, I lived in my house since 1969. I live in the village. Well, I used to live in the village. My house is in the same place. But <laughs> the, the, the real estate people have decided I live in the West Village, oh, okay. uh, which is better. <laughs> right. uh, so I'm not, I'm not arguing about it. Um, and there's a change in, in, in the village in, in, um, in much of Manhattan in the sense that Bleecker Street, which is sort of the nearest commercial street to me, um, it would be very hard uh, to get a, say, a tube of toothpaste or some shaving cream on Bleecker Street now, but if you're in the, in the market for a high-priced dress, um, it, there are a lot of stores uh, okay. that. Um, but, but it feels the same. I mean, the village, to me, uh, and as Gay said, there have been a lot of improvements. Um, it, you, it used to be you wouldn't be able to walk over by the Hudson. Now there's a beautiful park and a bike path, and, 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 uh, uh, and it still feels the same, the, except, well, I think the characters aren't, aren't I think people have been smoothed out a bit uh, in the village. Uh, we, uh, the Halloween parade the other night reminded me that, that uh, there used to be a guy we called Harold the Committed, uh, <laughs> who, uh, who would ask me, like, do I want the world as we know it destroyed in a nuclear holocaust? And I said, no, no. I don't. Uh, and he thought that we weren't raising our girls with enough political content. <laughs> and this was in the early Halloween parade where it was kind of a nice neighborhood event. He wanted my older daughter to go as Emma Goldman. Um, <laughs> And, and she went as a box of M&Ms that year. Uh, 
And he wanted my younger daughter to go as the dangers to our society posed by the military-industrial complex. <laughs> I said, Harold, we don't have anybody at home who can sew that well. Yeah. Uh, what a disappointment to him. Yeah. yeah. She went as a chocolate chocolate chip ice cream cone with chocolate <laughs> sprinkles. Uh, but I would agree with, with uh, that, that there's been a huge improvement uh, in the city by the immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Immigration Act of 1965, which barely made the front page, uh, has transformed the country, and, and particularly New York. Uh, and just as uh, in a matter of, say, eating, um, we had a system before based on national uh, quotas that, that favored Great Britain and the Northern Europe. Um, and actually let in more English people than wanted to come. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they never filled their quota right. and, and excluded Chinese. Well, in culinary terms, this is a suicidal <laughs> policy. Uh, uh, uh. Great. Well, Bud, I don't... I mean, I, I maybe misunderstood your question. That's okay. Is New York better? It's always better. Yeah. And we've been living under a kind of a benevolent dictator for <laughs> quite a while. And he's done some extraordinary and some extraordinarily stupid things. But he's done some great things. Mm -hmm. So I would never live anywhere else. I thought we were talking about technicality. Mm. So, well, let's talk a little bit about you, uh, Calvin. You mentioned, and for the record, we're, we're going with Calvin, not to make too fine a point on this, because Mr. Trillin spells his name, or is called Bud by the entire world, except for me, with one D. And we have this ongoing Bud with one D versus Bud with two Ds. But you, you should not be, you do not, should not be worried about that. That's something that we'll... And you shouldn't think that this Bud's putting on airs by putting another D. Uh, <laughs> It's perfectly okay, and nobody can blame him for that. Go ahead, bud. Uh, d. <laughs> you said front page of the paper. You've all had extensive uh, experience working at newspapers in New York. Uh, here's a question that we could spend the next hour and a half on. We will not, but I want to throw it out to all of you. Where are we right now as far as newspapers in New York City? Liz? Well, when I came here in 1949, and I'm older than all of these young guys. <laughs> uh, I worked for nine different newspapers. I did either freelance or I was hired by them and they went out of business. Now we have three and, well, I guess we have four. We have the Wall, Wall Street Journal, but two of them are despicable. <laughs> <laughs> and horrible, and, and though I made a lot of money under both of their names, I'm, I'm really quite ashamed of what they do. Right. And appalled at the quality of things. I guess it, it shocks me when I read the Times and they have sp spelling misspellings and things. They never used to have that. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't want to differ with such a grand lady, but <laughs> I think the Times is better now than when I worked there. I only worked <clears throat> for 10 years as a, as a reporter, as right. a daily reporter. And um, I, I read the Times now. It takes me sometimes two hours. I do carefully read it. I don't read other news. I, in the afternoons, I do read those favorite papers of yours, the news of the post. <laughs> but I think the Times is better now. It's, um, it's, well, it's a more intelligent paper because reporters are more intelligent. When I was a reporter, very few of us went to elite colleges. Bud Trillin, the graduate of Yale, was one of the exceptional people who went to Yale. In, in my defense, I never worked for a newspaper. Oh, that's why you went to Yale. Well, I'm, if you don't like him, it's not my fault. I have nothing to do with it. 
But um, <laughs> That's good. I, I, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but the Times is a much better paper than I worked when I, than when I worked on it. Well, it's more what, responsive. What well, I, it, it, I think the subject matter of the stories in the Times is broader now. Mm -hmm. Some of it drives me nuts, the 71 character, 71 uh, word lead, for example, <laughs> where you're trying to get to the end of that first paragraph God. and you're barely awake yet. <laughs> um, oh, well, I, I, I couldn't, I would love those. I used to try to write those long leads, 71 character, and rarely get away with it, but I used to, <laughs> I used to be so unhappy about it. So I'm glad you're happy with these short, mm -hmm. shorter versions. How about the tabloids, Pete? You, you, you were editor of both and, of them? No, I, it's not for me. It's a world, I, I, can you hum a Rihanna song? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Who the hell gives? A goddamn about what she does. Uh, we closed all the foreign bureaus in the world, it seems to me, mm -hmm. and, and, and we filled the space from, in the newspapers with uh, wardrobe malfunctions. <laughs> you know, people go in and say, oh, gee, the, on the beat, you gotta snap the thing in the back, and then the whole front of my dress falls off. Uh, it looks like press agents ha handle the content of the entire paper some mm -hmm. days um, in my, the tabloids. My complaint, Pete, is that they used to tell you something. I mean, good gossip, a yeah. good gossip story teaches you something, tells you something, makes you remember the people's names. I read page six. And I don't know a single person. What does a Kardashian do? And nobody is do? identified so that I will know them the next time. Hmm. But that's you, what I mean. In other words, you're talking about people called celebrities without right. knowing what they're celebrated for. That's exactly right. Well, you know, there's no Same. music they make that's terrific or passionate or important. Uh, there's nothing, no books they write that are any good, you know? What, right. what are they? Famous well, for being well, famous? when you're talking about every 10 years, I'd say the beginning of these, or the end of these 10 years, are the death of characters. There used to be great characters in the theater, as people like Ethel Merman who would just lay you to filth if she didn't like you. There were great characters yeah. on Broadway. There were great characters who were running restaurants. They and there weren't were great just people. characters on the streets. Yes. In and, the neighborhoods. And they're, you they're would say, gone, this mostly. guy's a real character. You know, and that meant something. He was part of a narrative that hadn't been spelled out. Yeah. You but all, it created writers. You all made decisions years ago to come here. And I want to briefly ask you briefly to uh, tell us the stories of uh, that decision and also perhaps a phone call home or a discussion at home for you, Liz, <laughs> in Texas in the late 40s saying, I'm coming to New York. How did it come about and, and was that an easy discussion to have or a not so easy discussion to have? Well, I was allowed to come to New York because I had a girlfriend who was engaged to a guy and her mother wouldn't let her go be with him unless she had me as a chaperone. So I arrived in Penn Station with $50, and these two people were to meet me, and I got in a phone booth to call the little hotel they were staying in, and a man tried to get in the phone booth with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought, this is, this is very exciting. <laughs> I lived my life going down. Was his down. name Wiener? <laughs> <laughs> so I worked a long time before I got a job in the newspaper. The, for some reason, the New Yorker and the New York Times, they turned up their nose at my Bachelor of Journalism. The University of Texas actually has a Bachelor of Journalism. Are there phone calls home like uh, I might come home, or I'm staying, or your oh, family, no. come on back, that type of thing? No, for the first three months I lived in New York, I would 
I couldn't read for the first time in my life, and I'd run out on the street and think, what will I do next? Where will I go? There are so many great places to go. There are places where you can have a full meal for a dollar and a quarter, you know, with wine and cutlery and so forth. I was so <laughs> dazzled by New York, and I haven't really been disappointed. Yeah. Gay, what was, uh, y you went from down the shore down to the University of Alabama before coming up to New York. Uh, your family okay with your decision? Did you wrestle with it, or was New York, it was gonna be New York or, or, or nothing? Well, I, I always wanted to work for a newspaper when I was in high school. And when I went to the University of Alabama, for which I'm very grateful to the University of Alabama accepting me as a student because no other, no college in New Jersey, my home state, or New York, or neighboring Pennsylvania, I couldn't get in. The only reason I got in Alabama, I, I've said this to you before, but my father was a tailor and he had a, his best customer was a surgeon who lived in our town but was born in Birmingham and was on the faculty, uh, medical faculty. And he, this doctor from Alabama, after I couldn't get into college, told my father he could get me in Alabama, for which I was very grateful. My father was grateful, so I went to Alabama. And I, but I worked on, I, I wasn't a good student there either. But I was on the newspaper, of the, of the university newspaper. And I wanted to come to New York. And I wanted to work on any of the seven papers, but I, the one paper I could get a job as a copy boy was the New York Times. So that became my paper and remains my paper. Uh, and I found, the greatest thing about journalism, it forces you to get to know all kinds of people quite different from yourself. One of the things I regret now for young people is that we don't have the military conscription anymore. One of the things about being in the Army out of a university, whether you go to Yale like, like Bud did or Alabama I did or wherever Liz, Texas, or, or Pete from B B Brooklyn by birth, Army gave us a chance to meet people of our age group who didn't have backgrounds university educations or any kind of education. Mm -hmm. We mingled and we got to know a lot about the country through the, through the experiences of those who are our age group, but not necessarily of similar ambition or similar background. So journalism was that way in getting you from day to day, sometimes your own idea for a story or sometimes an assignment foisted upon you by an editor. <coughs> you'd meet all kinds of people. You'd write about all kinds of people. So you got the in the city of New York, the universal sense of the city, the great variety and, and, and of, of people of, of different colors and languages and ambitions. And it's the greatest job. I think a newspaper job is the greatest job in the world I for agree. curious people. I agree. Curious people, and I think you've written also for shy people. For shy people, giving you the press card was a, a license to invade other people's privacy <laughs> with their <laughs> concurrence, you know. Yeah. And it's the greatest job. I mean, I. I I, I've always looked upon my, do, my youth uh, in the Times building as the happiest time of my life, not only because of the stories, but because of the people you work with. Right. When I quit the New York Times, it wasn't for any disagreement with the paper. I wanted to write about the reporters and editors I knew about. So I quit in 65, and the first thing I did is go back to interview the editors and reporters and copy readers and, 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 and window washers and elevator operators that I knew from my experience of being in the building in 229 West 43rd, as it was, and to write about them, and that was the first time I wrote a book that people read, was about the New York Times, right. The Kingdom of the Power, and that was just because I loved the people, more than I loved the stories we were asked to write, but the people I thought that were, that were there, reporters, this whole cadre of characters, were really interesting, and that's what my first book was about. Calvin, uh, family back in Kansas City, you decide you want to come to New York City. Are they okay with it, or did you have to? Well, I think the original decision was coming here for college. We, I, I, rather, rather than leave Kansas City and come to New York, I just didn't go home. <laughs> uh, and, and that decision was pretty simple because my father didn't go to college uh, and grew up in St. Joe, St. Joseph, Missouri, had read a book called Stover at Yale. Uh, when he was a boy and uh, decided that I should go to Yale. Uh, and after some ineffective rebellion, I, I went to Yale. Um, and as far as whether he was happy about what I did, 
Uh, I've looked for evidence that he would have approved. I always say that my father's aspirations for me were pretty simple. He wanted me to be president of the United States. <laughs> And his fallback position was that I not become a ward of the county. Uh, uh, and <laughs> I think that's kind of common for parents, really. Uh, I mean, sometimes you think, God, how did we produce this truly special human being? And sometimes you think, can that kid find his way home? I mean, then, um, so it was, and I looked for evidence that, that he would have approved um, uh, of, of what I did, uh, and I, th I think he did. He, he um, it, when I was about in eighth grade, the schools of Kansas City ran out of money and ended early, and my father didn't think that kids ought to be on the street that, that early, so he sent both my sister and me to Sarah Sean Hooley Secretarial School uh, <laughs> to learn how to type. And uh, and then my sister was, was liberated after our course for the rest of the summer, but I was made to type every day. Uh, it's the only thing like that my father ever did. And that's kind of the opposite of those days of what you do. You teach the girl to type so she could be a secretary. Uh, that is one of my kind of feeble pieces of evidence that he would approve. Uh, and, I, and I think he did. He, he, um, he was somewhat puzzled when I left Time for the New Yorker, because he was more familiar with Time uh, than the New Yorker. Um, and but but I think basically they were they were fine with it. Um, I think my father raised me to go out and I mean that that hit, to, to him Yale was the place where where the industrialists sent their sons and, and he was going to give me kind of an even start with them. Would you mind telling us the story uh, of when Time tried to make you the religion writer? <laughs> Well, I was, I was what was called a time of floater. Um, that is, I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember this, but Time and Newsweek uh, used to be divided into sections, music, uh, sports, press, religion, and then there was a bigger section in the front, foreign affairs and national affairs. And the people in the back of the book would sort of be, there was just one writer for each section, and he would get stuff in from the reporters all over the country. And he became sort of an expert at this. He would, I mean, the, say the religion writer would, that's how time had this authoritative tone. The religion writer actually had lunch with Lutheran liturgists and, and, and uh, drinks with the Lubavitcher PR guy and stuff like that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and read the quarterlies from the Presbyterians or anything. And then he would go on vacation, and the floater would come in uh, from, say, sports or sh show business, whatever he'd done the week before. Um, and, and we called it instant omniscience, because when you sat down at the guy's desk, suddenly you had that authoritative air, even though you had no yeah. idea uh, what was oh, going funny. on. And, but I got into the religion section, and the guy had found some great, what we used to call in the Army, TDY, temporary duty, I can't remember, but he was, he never, he came back, he wouldn't come back. So I tried to get out of the religion section by putting alleged in front of any historical religious event. <laughs> uh, 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 well, I, I, um, the alleged parting of the Red Sea, the... <laughs> 30 days after the alleged crucifixion, and, and um, it didn't do any good. The, yeah. uh, they were, they, they really, they, they were experienced with smart Alex yeah. in those days at times. They just crossed out the alleged. Uh, Pete, you've written about and you've spoken about uh, often about the notion of when you were growing up, the idea of there being a green ceiling that in your family uh, Irish-American family, the notion of, what, you're not going to be a cop? You're not yeah. going to be a firefighter? Well, the, the notion of ambition. My question to you is, do you think that still, and we can talk a little bit about that, do you think that still exists? Uh, or ha have uh, the decades I would changed think that? In certain places. Uh, the, the idea was, 
um, at the time, if you said to your parents, this didn't happen to me, by the way, but it was general on guys who were smarter than I was and someone who, they got married and that was it. They, they took the cops test or the fireman's test. Uh, it was like you were, if you had an ambition that was larger than your father's was, it's like, it was like having a, uh, committing a sin of pride. <laughs> you know, who do you think oh, yeah. you are? <laughs> you know, that kind of uh, uh, thing. And, you know, some kid wanted to be an actor or mm -hmm. something. Uh, what changed that? and began to erode it even when I was a kid, was the GI Bill. For the first time, the son of a Jewish cab driver, an Irish construction worker, uh, an Italian laborer, could go to the university. First time. Uh, there was gonna be enough money to go. It, it, particularly the older kids in a large family who had to help kick money into the uh, the house every week and take care of their brothers and sisters. Uh, I think the GI Bill changed it drastically. You know, for the first time, well, it was almost a whole generation not doing what the fathers did of, of men, of mm -hmm. American men. It was mainly men. There were some women, but mainly men. I think the times also changed very quickly. You know, once we hit the 60s, uh, people thought they could be Cliff Richards or something. Hmm. Uh, and they didn't, uh, Keith Richards rather. Uh, <laughs> wrong one. Well, Cliff Richards, perfectly fine <laughs> British musician. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, Keith was A little good arcane himself. in this yeah. discussion. Yeah. Uh, but I, if, for me, it never happened because I, I left high school after two years. I went to school a few blocks from here at, at Regis, uh, which was run by the Jesuits. And it was a great school and is a great school. Um, but I had other things I wanted to do. I wanted to write comic strips. I wanted to... Do, see the world I wanted there were all kinds of things and stuff in the family which my father got laid off after the war was over um, so I went off and I worked in the Brooklyn Navy Yard for a year as an apprentice sheet metal worker from which I learned nothing except how to show up <laughs> you know <laughs> you show up at eight o'clock and punch in you get paid you know and then I went in the Navy itself and got the GI Bill, and that gave me a way to go on. I went to school to Mexico, and I went to, sc to school at Pratt in Brooklyn. When you went to Mexico, excuse me for interrupting, when you went to Mexico, your family, any reaction like, you're going off to Mexico? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't say anything to me. Yeah. They knew I had a kind of wanderlust uh, you know, a sense of adventure and so on that I got from reading bad novels. Hmm. Um, but I, it, it was very important to me because when I finally did get a job as a newspaper man, uh, there were very few Latinos, none at the New York Post when I went to work there in June of 1960. So I became the Latino. <laughs> it was the first Latino with two parents from Belfast in Northern <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> Until they started to process Latinos in the youth, uh, university system, in the city university system, right. and get Latinos. Uh, but I, it, it, they gave me a chance, mm -hmm. and that was the other. That was the change, in in a way that Liz is talking about too. The the newspapers became more organized. In other words, it was no longer an editor taking a chance on some kid because he could write paragraphs and not just sentences. Um, 
Uh, it was a personnel manager deciding, does he fit into six different categories? Is he male, short, tall, blonde, blue-eyed? And one result of that was uh, the big change in the early 60s was that there were some talented people out there that never could have gotten jobs in the, in the newspapers as they got more organized. I think it's safe to say we're all affected by the homes that we grew up in, uh, formative years, no doubt. And again, all of you made this decision to come here. I'm curious if we could just address for a little bit the homes you grew up in and how you think the line between those homes and what you ended up doing here, was there a line? Was there a connection? Liz, you once said to me, that New York was great because it allowed a freedom from former lives. Uh, I grew up in a Southern Baptist household where, you know, people didn't smoke, drink, or curse. And uh, I had a grandmother who believed it was a sin for men and women to go in swimming together. So I was in happy the to. <laughs> <laughs> so I was happy to escape from Texas, and the University of Texas had taught me how to write a little bit, and I lucked into, I could type wow. 100 words a minute, so wow. I lucked into- You must have gone to Sarah Sean Hooley. <laughs> <laughs> I lucked into jobs, and later, when I was writing, my father once wrote me a note, he said, do you really know all of this stuff, or are you just trying to get rid of it? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I really never went back to Texas except uh, to make speeches and do memorials. And uh, I, I think now Pete has just said something so great about the GI Bill, because when I was at the University of Texas, the war was still going on. And uh, then the next year, all of these guys, the war ended, all these guys came back, and we had 80 people in classrooms, and they all went out and changed the world mm -hmm. because they had, so it was great to be a girl then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I was, I've always been very lucky. Okay. And, uh, and I've worked for some great men, like Mike Wallace. And you know, long before the Gossam Column started, you worked at Cosmo, you worked at Sports Illustrated, you worked for NBC, <laughs> you worked for CBS. Oh, working at Sports Illustrated was the best because I didn't know anything about sports. <laughs> and uh, there were only three women there. And so we traveled first class around the world writing stories about golf courses and socialites and so forth. And we were the soft side of Sports Illustrated. And for five years, I forgot that you had to carry money and passports because these guys who would be the, the writers who would go with me, they took care of all that. Wow. You know, little lady, here, here's your ticket. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Gay, you once said, uh, you've said, uh, talking about actually the process of writing and actually starting out by just writing sentences on a, on a, on a legal pad with a pencil, feeling, feeling the word. And you've actually connected that to your father and his work as a tailor. Yes, my uh, <clears throat> father greatly cared about craft. He <clears throat> didn't make hardly any money as a, as a tailor because he spent so much time crafting a suit and so few men in the town <clears throat> could afford or wish to afford the cost of a, of a handcrafted suit. And, um, but I did see him doing by hand <clears throat> what could have been done quicker with a sewing machine, but he felt that he would be doing a better job with his hands and making a suit. And he was absolutely right. It wasn't profitable, but it gave him a sense of achievement making something that would last. A suit that did not 
the seams wouldn't come apart after two years and the buttons didn't fall off. And I associated that with my own way of writing, with hand, not using the computer. I did learn, as you all have, to be a typist. The one thing in school I was good at was typing. <laughs> but, um, and why I became a reporter has to do with my background too, because during the war years, uh, the baseball teams, New York Yankees especially, did not go for spring training to Florida, as was the case before the war. And so the Yankees chose, beginning in 1944, when I was 12 years old, training in Atlantic City, which is 12 miles, 12 miles south of Ocean City. So I started going by trolley after school and sometimes quitting school to go by trolley to watch the Yankees during February of 1944. And they also were there in 45 as well. And that's where I first saw sports writers from New York covering the team, as well as the players. And I thought, boy, being a sports writer, following the Yankees, getting paid to write about it, seeing, I love sports. I mean, I really became hooked during spring training as a boy of 11 and 12. This was, this was the most magical thing in the world, to be a sports writer covering the great Yankees. They were a championship team then. Right. And I thought that's the best way to make a living. And in a way it is, to you get to be a little older and realize there's more to reporting than covering the Yankees. <laughs> but, um, and the other thing that made me wanting to be a newspaper man uh, was that during those war years, I saw my father reading the front page of the New York, or the foreign news of the New York Times. He read the paper every day, particularly being interested in Italy because Italy was then the battleground in 1943-44, an Allied invasion, and my father had soldiers in his family who were fighting for, the, for, for Italy against the Americans. So I had an interesting perspective of World War II as being the son of an Italian immigrant father whose brothers, younger brothers, were soldiers. And reading the newspaper as he did, this was how he would find out how things were going through this foreign reporting of the Times how the war was going, and as the, uh, the, the, the Times always had a lot of maps, and, the, and the, during the war, every day there was a map showing with an arrow pointing across Sicily towards southern Italy as the Allied armies under Mark Clark and the, and the Canadians and the English as well were, were going up the boot of the, uh, of, of, of the peninsula of Italy, and, and the war was moving closer through his hometown, and then through his hometown onto Naples. So I felt, again, being a foreign correspondent was the way of being in the middle of things, no less than a sports writer covering a championship season. And I also became attracted to the newspaper as a form of information. So I, it was almost destined that I would not be a tailor, but I would be a kind of journalist that would cared greatly about the craft of writing. And I got this, not from the Times as much when I got older, it was really from the New Yorker. I'd start reading short stories by my favorite writers, John Cheever, uh, Erwin Shaw, a wonderful writer, not remembered much now, John O'Hara, uh, sometimes uh, uh, others. And I thought to be a short story writer of the skill of being in the New Yorker level, and yet to do it with real names, to be a short story writer using real names and real situations, but still being a storyteller as the great writers the New Yorker were, was an aspiration that I still have. Mm -hmm. uh, you've all written extensively and occasionally written about family. And uh, Calvin, I think uh, you once uh, said that writing about your family is tricky business. <laughs> how, did it, how did it get started? Is there kind of an understanding, spoken or unspoken, that this is going to happen? Well, uh, of course, one of the things is how much you can say about your family. Uh, uh, when people say, um, well, it's art, so it doesn't make any difference if, if some people would have to be hurt or embarrassed or something, and I said, well, I have the Dostoevsky rule, uh, which is, if you have reason to believe you're another Dostoevsky, you can write whatever you want to about your family. <laughs> uh, 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 you, can, you can write about the time your mother confess to you that she didn't never really loved your father, um, <laughs> even if it makes things awkward in the retirement community. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but if you're not a, if you're not another Dostoevsky, you can't. Uh, you have to be. I, I I think, for instance, I I don't think anybody could read what I've written about my daughters and tell one from the other. Um, and I wouldn't. Um, and um, at at times, well, I was on a book tour once with a book I wrote about my father, and and. Someone asked me in a bookstore in San Francisco, do you ever worry about your own children writing about you? And I said, no, I don't worry at all, because when they were five and eight, I had them sign non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> uh, 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 the, the, nothing elaborate. I mean, I, I used the one they use at Buckingham Palace for the servants. And, uh, the little one couldn't write. I just put a sign there or something like that. Um, <laughs> but at a certain point, you did stop writing about them. I did. I stopped writing about them when they were about 10 or 11, I think. I, I didn't really do it consciously, but when I looked back for a book once, I realized that I had just automatically stopped. I mean, a, 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 a girl in middle school doesn't really need her father making wry remarks about her <laughs> behavior. Um, uh, at one point, I did do a, a piece on uh, a column on how the approaching vocabulary tests from the SATs changed the vocabulary of, of teenagers I knew. And I identified one as a teenager I know named S. Um, and, and that was uh, when they, they started to say, think, when I said, don't worry much about the test, it, a, lot, a lot of Colleges don't even use the SATs that much anymore, and you can always go to work in the dime store. And, <laughs> and, and they would say, not worrying would be a Herculean task. <laughs> uh, that is a task very difficult to perform, because in my group, there is no paucity of anxiety. Um, uh, they were all talking that way. They, they would wanted to say, well, I'll, I'll meet you, we'll, we'll pick you up at, uh, on 6th Avenue and 13th Street. I'll be in proximity to the mailbox. I mean, um, so that, but I had special permission to do that, and I cleared it. Um, and, uh, but I, I think it is, it is a problem, because in a way, uh, they didn't sign up to be written about. You know, I mean, it's not, it, it's not their fault that, that there's a writer in the house. Uh, and and uh, I know sometimes with my wife, w when the kids were off doing their homework and we it was kind of lingering after dinner, a glass of wine, got into one of those things that you know conversations that married people have, and, everything. and then I would say to her, "I hope you don't think what you just said was off the record." <laughs> uh, uh, but it was off the record. Yeah, good. So there's writing about family. There's right. writing about so many topics that you all have written about. Uh, uh, the columns through the years, uh, Vietnam, the mafia, uh, food. Right. And then there's writing about yourself, like in a drinking life or in, in dishing. Is there something different when you sit down, OK, this is going to be about me. Is there something different about the process than about than writing about someone else? Well, I uh, suppose I wasn't too self-conscious because by the time I started really writing columns, uh, I had met so many amazing people that I wanted to pretend I was one of them, I think. You know, I really never went back to Texas and certainly not since my good friend Ann Richards died and took with her whatever liberal human intent was going on. <laughs> I think we better let Texas secede. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we have another headline from this evening. <laughs> Pete, how about you, when you, when you wrote A Drinking well, Life? I, it's very hard to write only about yourself. As soon as you write about, uh, from the point of view of yourself, as I did in a memoir, and as many other people have done the same thing, 
you automatically are dealing with your father, your mother, your younger brothers, and or sister, or whatever. Uh, plus all the people that help shape you when you were young. Uh, and that could be a bookmaker on the corner. It could be a racket guy who loans people money till payday. It could, there's all kinds of people that could have an effect depending on the way you live your life. So uh, my rule to myself was that I couldn't write certain things if it was gonna hurt people. I didn't wanna hurt my father, I loved him. But he had a, a life, he lost a leg playing foot, uh, soccer, um, he, he, which meant he didn't cash in on all the stuff the Irish could get in this city, working on the construction and working on the waterfront and other places. He couldn't, that wasn't his thing. He couldn't do that. Um, uh, but, and, and he was a silent type, a Belfast Catholic. Uh, Seamus Heaney has a poem about the style. It's, the name of the poem is, Whatever You Say, Say Nothing. <laughs> uh, so that the, the Belfast men in particular were laconic and dry and removed in a way, because they could die for saying the wrong thing. So he, like other people, found a way to express himself through song through singing, through songs like Patty McGinty's Goat and uh, I had a hat when I came in and I'll have a hat when I go out. <laughs> you know, songs like that. And that had to affect me. That's why I loved hearing him sing that because he seemed happy. Um, and he was. Uh, we will get to your questions in just a second, but before we do that, I'd like to ask, and there are obviously so many topics we could discuss tonight, um, we'd be here for a while, but if I could ask for a snippet from each of your careers, uh, and since I'm sitting in this chair, I get to choose which snippet it is, if you don't mind, uh, a, uh, kind of a moment that stands out. And for Liz, I'm gonna ask you about when the Trump story is happening, and you've <laughs> got it, seemingly on the front page just about every day and on Channel 4 at that point as well, right? Live at 5. Um, what is it like to be kind of in the middle of that? Well, it made me famous. And uh, I, I mean, there were millions of people who had never heard of me, believe it or not. They <laughs> don't read newspapers or watch uh, the kind of television I was doing. So it, it meant a lot to me financially, and, and uh, I was pursued. And in the end, it was just a story about two rich people arguing over money. But I think it was a sort of forerunner of the non-news we get today. How, how long was that story really good for? One column item and maybe when they settled, another one. And I did that for three months. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, Curry. my friend, <laughs> Carl Bernstein, said that it was a disgrace that I was making money when Pulitzer Prize people were not. So later, I said the same thing back to him. This is, this is your friend saying this to you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there are always people who think you don't deserve the good luck you never expected mm -hmm. to get. Mm. Okay, uh, I come back to a story that you wrote at the University of Alabama about a gentleman named Hooch Collins. Yes. Tell us about that experience and that, what, the story behind that, that, that well, column. Well, when I went to, to the university, it was between 1949 and 1953, more than a decade <clears throat> before any kind of civil rights activity that would bring integration to that campus. But there was, uh, I, was a, I was on the college newspaper, and there was a black man named Hooch Collins, a former bootlegger, um, whose job was in the locker room of the sports teams, football, basketball. 
And he was a, an attendant, would collect the towels and clean the showers, and a factotum within the sports franchise there. But there was a ritual before the team, particularly the football team, the Alabama football team, went on the field. They would line up, and this black man would be leaning down, and they'd all put their hands on his head as they made their way out of the locker room into the stadium. Sign of good luck. You had to put your hand on Hooch's. And I wrote a piece for the college newspaper making the connection that this is a segregated school. And the only connection that really was intimate was the white hands of the football players and the basketball players on the, on, on the, on the, on the, on the forehead and the top of the head of this guy. And without writing anything that was polemic or, 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 or predicted better times ahead after the civil rights marches did finally produce in 65 a Voting Rights Act and led to finally integration on the University of Alabama campus, which didn't happen until 1972. It was, it was something that, that alluded to um, a situation that was both remote and yet intimate and, f and, and, and the aspiration was good luck on the football field while touching the head of this elderly black guy known as Hooch. That was all of that to it. Reaction? Positive. Yeah, there was, because no one understood it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little subtle for that class of readership I had at Alabama. <laughs> may I ask a you may. question? Uh -huh. I was reading something you wrote in 1970 where you said there were ants at the top of the Empire State Building <laughs> and nobody knew how they got there yeah. or what they lived on. They're still there. I, um, <laughs> I got that from an iron worker. Pete and I know iron workers. I once wrote a book about the building of the Verrazano Bridge, which I'm going to repeat next year. At the, the bridge is 50 years old next year, the oh, Verrazano Bridge. Great. Anyway, uh, this iron worker who was part of the group in the 1930s who put the top of that tower together, we now know as the Empire State, he said, there were ants up there. I said, God, no, how do you, I saw them, I was around them. Oh, Jesus, I put that in a book. And um, it got readers such as you remember that. Well, thank you, Liz. <laughs> I remember everything. You're, you're so great. Thank you. I heard okay. that an ape carried the ants up to the <laughs> top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Calvin, when, when we think of you, we think of uh, the pieces through the years, the pieces about food, uh, pieces obviously with uh, a, a good dose of humor in them. Mm -hmm. And th I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the beautiful piece about your wife, Alice, off the page right. in The New Yorker. Uh, yeah. But one of your first experiences was covering the civil rights movement and yes. covering the Freedom Rides. And your first book was... Uh, yeah, an education in Georgia. Right. It was the first New Yorker piece that I did uh, about uh, Charlene, uh, then Charlene Hunter, later Charlene Hunter Galt, right. and Hamilton Holmes going to the University of Georgia. Um, I, I spent a, a, a year in the Time Bureau in Atlanta, and I think it was really my first, I had had some kind of temporary jobs, but I, then I was out of the Army, and this was sort of, my first grown-up job, really. And uh, I think I still was unsure of if that's what I wanted to do. And uh, I remember stopping in Washington um, a couple of years later when I went back when they were about to graduate, uh, and I did that piece in the book. And I, and I had dinner with uh, my friend uh, Bob Semple, who was still on the the board of edit, the editorial board of the New York Times, and he was working in the Washington. Um, I think it was the Dow Jones had that paper for a while. I can't remember the name of it. It was sort of a folksy paper, <laughs> and and um, he had just done a story for them that uh, talked about about calling somebody to find out what something and his secretary not doing, and then arguing, and then looked around the sitting room and all the people were doing the same sort of thing and he said is this a job for a college graduate mm -hmm. and I think it may not be I mean there's a lot of it that doesn't have anything to do with that 
And, uh, but after I went to the South for that year, I just couldn't imagine doing anything else. Uh, but I was, I was very lucky that I was there for a year when a lot happened. As you may know, the, the civil rights story in the South moved on plateaus, so there sometimes would be two or three years when there was nothing happening right. because there wasn't any real push from the federal government. Uh, but the year I was there uh, was the, uh, the Freedom Rides, the sit-in movement, the integration of Atlanta and Nashville, the New Orleans schools. The, um, um, so, so there was a lot happening. And um, the, the head of the bureau, I was the second man and the junior man in the bureau, and the head of the bureau, who was married and had three or four kids, actually liked to stay home with his family. Um, so he would send me out. And I couldn't imagine how anybody could do that. Mm. I was single then and young, that I got to go to these places and get chased by rednecks and stuff. <laughs> and and he, he, he just missing out on everything, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> just staying home with his wife and family. Hard to uh, believe. Uh, yeah. Unless I have my research, I've done my research incorrectly, there is one person sitting on the stage who has won a Grammy Award. It's not necessarily for music. But it's, it's kind of connected to music. Pete Hamill won a, unless I have something wrong. No. Grammy Award? No Grammy Award? Uh, uh, does an Oscar? No, never No mind. Grammy Award. <laughs> <laughs> Pete Hamill no. won a Grammy Award for the liner notes on one of the great albums of all time, Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks. Yeah. <laughs> it's not well known, but Pete wrote all the songs also. <laughs> he recorded all the songs, and Dylan was having a rough time, so he gave him credit. How, how did that connection Yes, Can I just add one thing I brought because of Pete, who was, I had the great fortune to make him, to name him a living landmark of New <laughs> That's York. That's true. So we've had a lot of fun together. He has a kind of a marble look. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so all of you know who, of who <laughs> all of us old fashioned people know yeah. who Jonathan Schwartz is. And. Now he is on WNYC all the time, featuring a streaming site called the JonathanChannel.org. And we would have lost him otherwise, because radio is too stupid to hmm. keep. Yeah, they're still. <laughs> this was in the New Yorker, so I guess it was okay. It's been fact checked. <laughs> <laughs> How did you come to have a connection with Dylan and write the notes and be in the studio also for the recording of part yeah, of the album? Yeah, I had known him earlier when he did his first uh, Gertie town Spoke. hall. Oh, I think Gertie Spoke City mm -hmm. was the first time he was the, in New York. The first concert yeah. Yeah. Oh, thing, I, thing rather than a club. Yeah. Uh, he invited me to come, I, and I had never heard of him. How, he heard it, how come he knew you? From reading the oh, stuff in the oh, post. Oh, I, I had done a series on 42nd Street called mm -hmm. Lostville when it was heroin and yeah. all kinds of other stuff just <laughs> hanging around. Um, so I got to know him then and I would see him every once in a while when he lived in New York and then he, he pulled up stakes and went to the West Coast. Right. But out of the blue, he called me and said, I'm doing an album in New York. I'd love you to write the liner notes. I said, OK. Uh, simple as that. Do you I know what liner notes, that, did you know what that meant? Yeah, that I know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually won another one for a Dexter Gordon album. Oh, Cold as two. different as You've day and night. Out on us here. Wow. The interesting thing uh, is that young people now probably would not know what liner notes so is because no album. I go to the studio, which was on the street near the Colony uh, Records, uh, Colony Music. Right. And at some point, Mick Jagger comes in. God. And they had just finished doing a version of Shelter for the Storm, Shelter from the Storm. Right. Playing music was already recorded and singing into the recorded music. And there's Jagger standing next to Dylan going, I can't hear it. Nobody can hear it. 
Bye, see you later. And he leaves. And I said to Dylan, what was that all about with Mick Jagger? What did he say to you? He said to me, the song is great, but the music sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so they redid all the music on that basis of that one, con they obviously had some ambiguity about the music, right. the, uh, Dylan and the producers and the others. Seems to turn out, have turned out okay. You win the yeah. Grammy, you bring it home. I bring it home. One day is... I come home from the newspaper. I have custody of my two daughters with somebody ta helping take care of them when I'm late at the office. I come in to the house in Brooklyn. Um, the both of them are acting very weird. <laughs> I said, okay, what happened? Well, what happened? He said, you know the, the thing that you had on the mantelpiece? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that has a horn coming out of it? <laughs> it looks like an RCA Victor right. yeah. Victrola. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, what about it? And one daughter goes in and gets the two pieces that it's now <laughs> in and bring it to me, ashamed of herself. And I break into laughter. Mm. <laughs> I couldn't help it. It was, you know. And what had happened, they were playing football in the living room. <laughs> and you go out for a long one with a... <laughs> With Gra the Grammy, it, you miss somebody's hands and it mm, breaks yeah. into <laughs> Grammy can hand. make a great football. So I kept it. You could, now it's not about Dylan or anything. Right. It's about those two girls yeah. that I love so much. Some questions from the audience. Here we go. And I'm sorry we won't be able to get to all of them. Uh, this one we could spend hours on. Do you miss Elaine and her restaurant? Well, that's one of the changes, not for the better, because that woman... Uh, irreplaceable woman um, was so much a part of that restaurant. It wasn't the restaurant, it was the fact that it was, it was seven nights a week of Elaine's and those nights were long and there's no restaurant in New York that I know of that is available for people who want to dine at one o'clock in the morning. You think about New York, the city that never sleeps, that's not true. The, there are very few restaurants that after midnight you can get a meal. P.J. Clark's, if you call that a meal, but <laughs> uh, that's, that's one of the changes that I wish had not happened because it's negative. Another question from the audience. We've, uh, please comment on the role of NPR to the news and information realm. We've talked a little about newspapers and where does NPR play a role in all of this? They said you could sell books in NPR. Wasn't that what your publisher told you? If you get interviewed for NPR, you have My readers. My publisher told me a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, I, I, I think that NPR um, has been a great service. Uh, and and uh, I, I hear it when, when people say uh, this is sort of an elite uh, e e you know, East Coast educated thing. I don't think that's true. When I used to do a piece for the New Yorker every three weeks, I did that for 15 years, and I was always out. I find farmers who listen to NPR. And I mean, I, I think that that it, that, uh, that it's done a good job. I don't know. Uh, I think maybe Terry Gross. You can sell books on on. I can't remember the name of her show now. Uh, fresh air. Fre fresh air. No, right. fresh air. Fresh air. Yeah, I but think. But also it adds a voice of intelligence to Yes, and, and, to and they stop, and, and it's not 22 minutes and we'll give you the world. Mm. It, it's, it's, it, I it, can't <laughs> listen and work. There's no way to do it. I, when I was young, I could listen to everything, but I can't listen to music where people sing. <laughs> people always complain that NPR is asking them for money. And... Uh, I just send my check whenever I get anything. I feel that's the least I could do for them and the least I could do for something 
that takes news seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah. No matter, maybe it's not as much fun as, uh, yeah. you know, the four big things in, in the news now, in the lower echelons of the news, are food that costs too much money, um, fashion, they've all gone crazy about fashion. I forget the other two, they're <laughs> equally. <laughs> but I mean, it's not news. Right. Uh, this is for Pete. Did you originate the quote, he was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple? If so, to whom were you referring? <laughs> That was no, I think it was. Uh, that was Ann Richards. Ann Richards, yeah. Ann Richards did that. That was part of her speech in the Atlanta That's convention right. when yeah. Dukakis yeah. was nominated. But the other line got. It was about George W. Sure. Bush. Oh, yeah. that's right. That's uh, the father. The other line was uh, the, you know, born with a spoon in her mouth. That was the line that got the, the big attention right. from that speech. Yeah. Uh, can Calvin tell the story about playing tic tac toe? with the chicken in Chinatown. <laughs> the, the, Sidney Goldstein, who runs City Arts and Lectures uh, in San Francisco, has told me that any time I mention the chicken, she's taking $500 off my fee. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, it was by request. Um, as some of you may know, there, there used to be a chicken that played tic-tac-toe in Chinatown. Um, and I would take out-of-town visitors on a walk from the village where I, the West Village, excuse me. Uh, I used to take them from the village. Now we, we start in the West Village and uh, walk down to, um, to Chinatown and uh, give them a chance to play tic-tac-toe with a chicken after, after a lunch. And the chicken was in a glass cage with the uh, sort of lights that, that are familiar to anybody who wasted his life on, in pinball when he was a child. And, and, and the, they lit up and they said things like, your turn, bird's turn. And, <laughs> and they had X's and O's out. You could push your, your buttons to get your, make your X's. And the chicken would get behind a little booth that said thinking booth on it. And, peck his answers. Um, and if you beat the chicken, you got a very large bag of fortune cookies, which had only cost 50 cents to play, and fortune cookies were probably worth 35 or 40 cents. Um, and and um, I had heard, and there were various theories about the chicken. Some people thought there was a computer involved. Uh, some people thought he was a very smart chicken. Um, and whoever I took down there, 100% of the people looked over the situation and said, well, the chicken gets to go first. Uh, and I say, But he's a chicken. Uh, you're a human being. Surely there should be some advantage uh, in that. And then a lot of them, not every one of them, but a lot of them said, chicken plays every day. Uh, 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 I haven't played since I was a kid. I, um, so I never saw anybody beat the chicken. A and I. I later did a piece on the chicken. Roy Blunt Jr., who probably has been on this stage many times, had told me once that the chicken was trained by former graduate students of B.F. Skinner. Um, uh, and, and I always hoped that that was true because it, it was a refutation of the false teaching that graduate work is of no value in the everyday world. Uh, uh, and it turned out it was true. They, from, and these are people from um, uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, President Clinton's hometown. There's no connection in that. But, um, and I later did a piece on it, and I, and I went down there. There was a guy, it, it had become, through spinoffs of their animal training, the sort of small animal training capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I went to a guy who ran a place that had been called IQ Zoo. 
Um, he had a parrot that roller skated and, and a, um, a pig that drove a small Cadillac. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he said he had one act that was uh, a chicken danced uh, while a rabbit played the piano and a duck played the guitar. And I said, uh, what tune do they play? And he said, their choice. Uh, I was just, uh, suddenly into my mind came Elaine Kaufman. Uh, I know nobody knows this story. Uh, we made her a living landmark of the conservancy. And she was so proud of that, so unlike her public self. She, she was almost pathetically grateful. <laughs> and so I, having known her forever, uh, had the pleasure of introducing her and so forth. And at the end of the evening, George Steinbrenner came up to me and said, Liz, I have something for you. He gave, gave me an envelope with $100,000 check in her honor to the New York Conservancy, which saves buildings and parks. And, and that was the most money we had ever been given at one time. And she sold 10 tables of guests. So she, she was convinced that she was loved. Mm. And, and she died shortly after that. Mm. As we start to, start to wrap up, in the world of sports, uh, specifically baseball, there's always the story about the, uh, the pitcher, the veteran pitcher, and the question is to the pitcher or just a, about him in general, does he still have his fastball? You are all still writing and you've done it for many years. As you're going through the process now, is there ever the question, as you're writing, do I still have my fastball? <laughs> do I still have it? Okay? Well, <clears throat> I still have, as I did when I was 50 years younger, <clears throat> a feeling that I'm doing something for the first time. And I don't know that I've learned anything from all that I've had published because as I'm now, you mentioned family, you were talking about family before. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm trying, and one of the things I'm doing is to try to write about marriage, having the longest marriage of anybody I know, 54 years. But um, I, I think I can, I can do it, but on the other hand, it's hard to interview your wife. Mm -hmm. As someone said here before, I think it was Bud about children, you know, they didn't, they were, they didn't ask to be born into a writer's family, therefore you have to be very more than sensitive when it comes to writing about them, and he ceased doing it when the daughters were a certain age, as he told us. So what I've done is, is I think I still have a capacity to write a book, which I'm doing, but sometimes I'd need a relief pitcher. And I have hired a relief pitcher to interview my wife. This is a woman named Katie Royfe. I don't know if you know her, she's a fine writer. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a book called Uncommon Arrangements about marriages of the period of, of the Bloomsbury period. Now, that's a perfect person to read. Uncommon Arrangements, I think we have one in my own marriage, though it is 54 year marriage. So I have it, I can do the book, but sometimes your fastball is not enough. You need some relief pitching. So I have that. How about the rest of you? Is there ever an element of doubt after all these years that you can still write? Or once that page or the computer is in front of you, it's just like 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago? Uh, Except that we don't all get paid very much for it anymore. Mm. I would well, separate, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Liz. Well, I was just going to say, I'm still writing five days a week for the New York Social Diary, so I get to tweak 
all of these rich people that look at it every day to see if their picture is there. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't write gossip any, anymore. I, I don't hear any gossip worth writing. And uh, I just write what I think where I've been. And it appears in the Huffington Post and the Chicago, what's left of the Chicago Tribune. But uh, yeah, I lost my fastball when, <laughs> when people then reduced gossip to such a low state. Maybe it wasn't that you lost <laughs> no. your fastball, just that the game changed. I don't know. Well, I, I'm sorry. I think things started to go downhill for Liz when the phone booth started to disappear around here. <laughs> uh, 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 you can't find a decent phone booth anymore. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure about losing the fastball. I think I've lost, uh, I haven't lost any, uh, anything in writing, I think. Um, and of course, as you grow older, you have more experiences to draw on. Um, I think I've lost some zest for reporting. Uh, I mean, I do it still, but I, I think, um, somebody said to me the other day, there's, after a while, you have just sat on that bench outside the assistant chief's office in some town <laughs> waiting to see him too many times yeah. you know that that yeah. it, it's a, i think reporting of a certain kind is sort of a young man's game um but i uh and then i had a sort of a lull between pieces uh a while ago and i thought it's too bad this is all i do uh <laughs> I, I mean i i can see somebody else saying this would be a good time to recatalog my collection of Civil War artifacts or so. Uh, I don't have any Civil War artifacts. Um, uh, so I guess I'm just, uh, that, that's why writers don't retire. That's what they do. Pete? I mean, I, again, getting older, uh, the best I can hope for is to write better about less that I don't have to write as much as I did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and I know more. So that means I'm gonna be slower anyway, try, because I understand the, the complexity of human beings uh, without understanding any solutions about human beings, but to know that they're a lot more complicated than you thought they were. Uh, so that writing fiction, um, and again, I couldn't, do, I agree with, but I, I couldn't do the reporting very well, I don't think. I couldn't run around in Syria right now. Uh, uh, but, I, but I've learned a little bit about living in this strange world and here in this city, the capital of people who are not like you. Um, it's a good capital. Um, last thing, I started the evening by talking about how you all are, are, and this evening I think has borne this out, wonderful storytellers. So if you each could, um, in, a, in a lifetime full of wonderful moments, and I, I would imagine seminal moments, is pick out a moment for us, perhaps early on, when you're here, from the various places from which you came, and perhaps either gradu a gradual feeling or maybe just one moment where you start to realize it's happening, it's working, I'm here, the city is great, I'm doing this work that I love. Uh, is there a, a moment like that for each of you? I hope. Is there such a moment, perhaps early on or maybe later on when you, it dawns on you that this has worked? Liz? <laughs> well, um, when I was already very old, uh, I was asked to appear on 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace, who had hired me in 1953, and we've been friends ever since. So I said, how can I do this interview? Aren't you supposed to be dispassionate and mean and all of the things <laughs> people hate? And he said, we occasionally do things about people who have gone beyond themselves. 
So he did a great interview with me and asked me a lot of embarrassing questions I would have preferred not to answer. And at the end, he leaned over and said, I love you, Mary Elizabeth because he <laughs> was a, always used my whole name. And I said, I love you, Myron. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I thought that was the greatest moment of my life. And he rolled around on the floor for a while, <laughs> arguing that they should keep it in 60 minutes, but they didn't. Mm. So I've got it. <laughs> Pete? I mean, the great moment for me, uh, I was very young. I was maybe five. I couldn't read yet. And uh, my mother, uh, the most important building in our neighborhood was the library. On, it's still there on 9th Street and 6th Avenue in Brooklyn. And she brought me down there got me my first library card, and then t on her own card, took out the story of Babar. Uh, this little elephant who wore a green suit, so I knew he was Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and on page two of the book, uh, she's reading and moving her fingers through the war, the, uh, uh, words. Some idiot of a hunter comes with a gun and shoots Babar's mother, kills her. And I started to cry. Uh, the, the idea that somebody would kill your mother was like, how could that be? Um, and so Babar goes wandering off heartbroken, uh, and finds his way to this place called Paris. <laughs> Although the name wasn't in the book, in the text, my mother explained that it was Paris. Ever since, I've loved Paris and hated guns, <laughs> <laughs> and wish I could write a book as simple and elegant and human as that book about a little elephant boy. Hmm. Calvin? Okay. I don't think, I don't know if there's any moment. I, I remember a, a moment once when we were coming, I drive a lot through the city. Um, I was asked the other day for a program at the library, they like to get, for you to give a seven word biography of yourself. <laughs> And my biography was resident, out-of-towner, competent, parallel parker. <laughs> uh, um, and we had been at a dinner uptown or something, and we were going home to the, to the West Village, <laughs> and, uh, and we, down 7th Avenue through Times Square, and I, and I looked and I suddenly realized, my God, we just casually passed through Times Square. Uh, uh, actually, we live here. You know, this, this, is, this is just ordinary to us. And it struck me as, as that, that I really hadn't realized as much um, where I was. Uh, and and, uh, and I, think, I think resident out of towner is, is sort of sums up uh, still how I think of myself. Right. Uh, okay, I'll give the last word to you. Well, a, a rather <clears throat> triumphant moment I can recall was when I was researching in the early, in the late 1960s and into the early 70s, I was doing a, a research of a book on the mafia. <clears throat> and the mafia people I was writing about were from Brooklyn. It was the Bonanno Mafia family. And there was old man Joe Bonanno. His son, someone about my age, was the lieutenant in the mafia family. And I really cultivated that guy so that I would have him sometimes come to dinner. And I got, went to dinner at the old at Bonanno's uh, place in Brooklyn. And one night, um, sometimes he would show up 
show Bill Bonanno, my main, main character in my book on my father is Bill Bonanno. One, sometimes he'd show up and he didn't call you because he's afraid using the phone, everything was tapped. And so he'd just show up, knock on the door. And one time, it must have been 1970, 71, I was, Nan and I were, suddenly I, I was supposed to have a dinner with Abe Rosenthal, who was my boss at the New York Times then. He wanted me to have dinner with him, Abe did, and Nan as well. And we didn't have a babysitter. So we're, I was thinking, how do we get someone? I was on the phone. <laughs> just then, knock on the door, Bill Bonanno, hey, I'm, just, I'm in town now, maybe we have dinner. I said, gee, Bill, I can't. In fact, I'm looking for a babysitter. I have to, I have to go to see Abe Rosenthal. He's invited Nan and myself. And, and Bill said, Bill Bonanno said, well, I'll, I'll babysit for you. <laughs> And he had these two bodyguards outside the house. And I said, sure, come on in. So I went to Abe Rosenthal's for dinner that night. And I said, you wouldn't believe he was taking care of us right now. <laughs> I, I, I think that when we talk about change, one of the changes is now you don't have to be a mob boss to have your phone tapped. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we, before we wrap up, uh, first of all, a thank you to all the behind the scenes people here at the 92nd Street Y who work tirelessly each and every night to make these evenings. The sound guys, the stage people, they w work uh, very hard just to make these evenings flow as, as smoothly as they do. So a thank you to all of them. And, Each of you, each of you, have made us laugh, and you've made us smile, and you've made us think, and you've made this city a richer place. We thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for all of it.